Welcome to Harlandale Christian Church. We're glad that you're able to join with us as we celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, uh, as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our God and our Father in Heaven together. It's such a joy to be able to, to, to share in worship and to fellowship with each other and to come together and know that God is here in our midst as He's promised. Uh, would we'll read from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, as we begin our worship service today, as Luke records the instance of that uh, resurrection day, the very first Easter. Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. And on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they'd prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Let's rejoice in that and pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for, uh, for the resurrection. For your, uh, in that you show us your love and your great mercy for us, for me, for all of us here, as we recognize that you uh, allowed your only begotten son to become the sacrificial lamb to pay the price for our sins thank you father for loving us like that and thank you for drawing us together today that so that we can celebrate the resurrection of our of our risen savior i pray that you will speak to our, our hearts speak to each one of us uh, fill our hearts and our lives with your joy because your spirit is here in our midst and father receive our praise as we lift these hymns and these songs and our study of your word as we would open our our ears and our hearts to allow your scriptures to speak to us bless us and speak to us truly today father we thank you 
that Christ is risen. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we begin our worship sec uh, songs, uh, the, this first song, the resurrection hymn, might be one that's less, uh, per perhaps less familiar, but it's, uh, uh, you'll get used to the rhythm and the music. And think about the words as you uh, read them or sing them. Uh, let's, jo let's go together in worship and praise to the Lord.
as beautiful as you You opened my eyes to your wonders and you You captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one I love Beautiful one I adore Beautiful one What a joy it is to be able to share in communion on Resurrection Sunday. What a perfect reminder of how the Lord has provided this service, this communion, these emblems, the bread and the cup to remind us of the sacrifice that was made for, for our sins. And yet he didn't just die. He didn't just go to the grave, but on that resurrection day, 
he was raised from the grave. I'd like for you to think about one word today during this communion time. Anxiety. You know, it's the worry about what might happen. You might lose your job. You, in this, this last uh, year or more, you'd worry about whether you're going to be affected or, or get the uh, COVID uh, virus. Maybe get hit by a meteorite. Hey, hey, it could happen. Or for that matter, be abducted by aliens. Have I given you enough to, to worry about so far this morning? And yet, we're here together to worship the Lord, and you're content, right? And so many of us are content only when we're, we're, we've worried everything out. We've worried about everything, and we just figure that's it. But Christ tells us that we're to take no thought for the morrow. Rather, we're to live trusting God for today and for the future. So many of us, though, uh, will announce and will proclaim that, yes, I trust God, and then worry about tomorrow anyway. Let me give a, uh, an instructive counterexample of this. You remember Indiana Jones? Snakes, not Nazis, giant boulders, and who knows what else might be in his, one of his constant problems. One particular instance might be a, enough. You might remember this scene. The crowd parts to, to reveal a menacing villain who's his wrapped, his face is wrapped up to his eyes, and he's flashing a scimitar. And your first reaction when you watch this scene is, Indy's in trouble? There's no way. And of course, Indiana Jones simply pulls out his pistol and shoots the man. But for a moment, it looked like it was all done. It looked pretty grim. And I'm told that this was actually an ad lib by Harrison Ford as he played that part. Question. How is it that Harrison Ford gets through the day as Indiana Jones? I know it's just a movie, but it's easy. He read the script. He knows what happens next. Well, let's bring this to communion, especially communion on Resurrection Sunday. Communion, you remember, celebrates Christ's death. If this were a movie, you'd think that this was the very last scene. But the script had been written long before time began. We even have a partial copy of it in the words of the prophets, the Old Testament. Death looked invincible as well as, as horrible. But turn the page. Turn the page and there's the resurrection. It's just as God wrote it. So today, as you take the cup and the bread, remember. Remember the sacrifice that made Easter possible. Remember that this happened according to God's script. In short, remember just who's in charge of this universe. Do not fear death. The script says, in Christ you rise too. Our communion song today is, There is a Redeemer. As we partake of the bread and the cup this resurrection day, remember that the resurrection is what makes Jesus Christ our Redeemer. Let's pray. O oh God and our Father in heaven, again we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you together, especially today, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for these emblems, the bread, the cup, that remind us of the sacrifice that was celebrated on Good Friday as Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, went to the cross of Calvary in my place, in our stead. Father, thank you for scripting this out. 
for letting us know that if we accept your son Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that this remembrance reminds us that we too shall rise. Help us remember that, Father, that today as we partake of these emblems. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for the past five weeks, you know, we've been in a series of messages called Against All Odds. This series was based on a monumental chapter in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah is an incredible book. He was an incredible prophet. And chapter 53 is such an incredible chapter for us to read. 
You know, the prophet Isaiah recorded his predictions uh, 700 years before Jesus was even born. 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 53 describes 24 actions the Messiah would, would experience that were all fulfilled by Jesus during Holy Week. Remember, Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would be despised, uh, betrayed, and rejected. He predicted that Jesus, the Messiah, would be silent when he was facing his accusers. He predicted that, he would, that Jesus would bear our sorrows and our sins. And by bearing our sorrows, he would heal our, our sickness. He predicted that, that Jesus, the Messiah, would pay the price for, for our wrongdoings. Isaiah predicted that, that Jesus would be successful, which is really an understatement because with, with over 2 billion followers today, Jesus Christ is by far the most successful person ever to live. And he also predicted that, it, that Jesus, the Messiah, would rise from the dead. 24 predictions in all in one chapter, Isaiah 53. The reason we've called this series Against All Odds is because several years ago, a mathematician named Dr. Peter Stoner did some work that, with probability theory. He sat down and he determined the odds for any one person fulfilling eight prophecies of Scripture. Stoner's calculations showed that the probability of fulfilling eight prophecies was so minuscule that it would be virtually impossible. Stoner said the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled eight prophecies is one in ten to the seventeenth power. And that number is a one with seventeen zeros behind it. It's called one hundred quintillion. A number that big is hard to grasp, so Stoner illustrated it like this. He said, suppose we take 10 to 17th power silver dollars and lay them in, on the face of Texas. They'll cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of those silver dollars, stir the whole mess thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one because it has that mark. What chance would he have of getting the right one? One in 10 to the 17th power. What are the odds that anyone could fulfill eight? What are the odds that anyone could fulfill 24 prophecies of scripture as in Isaiah 20, uh, 53. What are the odds that anyone could fulfill 48 prophecies of scripture? That number is so big that we don't even have a name for it. But in his life, Jesus not only fulfilled 48 prophecies in his death alone, he fulfilled over 330 prophecies in his life. What are the odds? What are the odds? Virtually impossible. Today being Easter, we're not going to talk about those all, all 48 prophecies, but we're just going to talk about the great prophecy, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. What are the odds that a dead person could come back from the, from the grave? Well, coming back from being called dead has happened a few times. Most of these times involve an emergency room or an operating table or being trapped under icy water and being revived afterwards or something like that. Coming back from dead has happened, but not often. And when it does, that person is ruled dead for just a few moments. But remember this one point. Jesus was not revived. He was resurrected. Jesus was not revived. He was resurrected. What are the odds that someone who had been crucified and pronounced dead by a professional Roman executioner, what are the odds that uh, he, this man had had his uh, uh, 
a spear thrust into his heart. And the crowd watched as clear pericardial fluid gushed out of that open wound, showing that his heart had burst and the chambers of it had collapsed. What are the odds that his body was pried from the nails that had held it to the cross? and then wrapped in 200 pounds of spices, including his face, his nose, and his mouth. What are the odds that this man was laid behind a 2,000 pound stone? That, what are the odds that he could revive himself, move the stone, walk 14 miles that afternoon, and convince his friends that he was completely restored to health? Zero? Zero? Zip? Nada? Jesus' resurrection is more than just being revived. It's a miracle. God performed a miracle in bringing his son back to life. A miracle against all odds. You know, we make a big deal out of Easter because Easter, the resurrection, is a big deal. Jesus came back to life proving that God is powerful, demonstrating that Jesus was and is who he said he was, and that there really is life after death. Isaiah 53.10, reading from the Living Bible, says, But it was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and fill him with grief. Now that happened on Good Friday. However, when his soul has been made an offering for sin and that happened at the crucifixion, then he shall have a multitude of children, many heirs. That's us as Christians. He shall live again. That's the resurrection. And God's program shall prosper in his hands. My friends, God's program is the church with branches in every nation of the world today. God's program, it really is doing very well, thank you. And verse 11 says, And when he sees all that is accomplished by the anguish of his soul, he shall be satisfied, and because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant shall make many to be counted righteous before God, for he shall bear all their sins. What are the odds that this could happen? That it would happen. That it did happen. Let's walk through this resurrection story today. I'd like for us all to be able to walk out of here today, able to think, to think through and understand exactly what happened on Resurrection Sunday. Now, all four gospel writers record it, but let's read it from Luke's account. We read a portion of this as we began our worship service today. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. You know, Christians gather for worship on Sunday because Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the grave. Verse 3, they went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. Be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Luke 24, verse 9. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And when he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen clothes. So he went away amazed at what had happened. All right, so what do we know so far? What do we know from this record that happened on Easter? There are at least seven things, though we only see part of it in Luke's account. Let's walk through what we know. First, 
Just before dawn, three women went to the tomb to finish dressing Jesus' body for burial. We know that from Luke 24, verses 1 to 12, and Mark 16, 1. Now, John mentions two Marys and a Joanna. Mark mentions the two Marys and a daughter of one of the Marys, whose name was Salome. And so it's possible that there were actually four, maybe more women who witnessed the resurrection. But isn't that just the opposite of what you'd expect if you were fabricating an, uh, an account, if you were coming up with a story to tell the, the masses? Because having women witnesses would do you no good in a court of law in that day because females in that culture couldn't even testify in a court of law. The second thing we know is that while on the way, there was an earthquake we find in Matthew 28 too. There was a lot of shaking going on that day. You know, earthquakes are not common in Jerusalem. And so they remembered this one. This earthquake split a crack in the ground that still is there today. Third, angels announced that Jesus was risen. Luke 24, 4 and John 20, verse 12. These angels appeared in the form of men. Matthew tells us that one of the angels appeared like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. A fourth thing we know. The women reported the news to the disciples. They ran back to town and met where the disciples were basically hiding out in Luke 24, 9 to 10. The fifth thing. On the way to report it, they actually encountered Jesus in the flesh in Matthew 28, 9 to 10. The sixth item we know, the disciples did not believe the report of the women. Imagine that. We've already talked about that the women could not even be a witness in a court of law, but the ones that they'd been with, some of them part of their family, they didn't believe what the women said in Luke 24, 11. Would you believe? These people had just seen Jesus die a horrible death on, the, on, on a uh, cross in a death penalty. They watched the Roman soldiers thrust a spear up under his ribcage, piercing his heart, and clear fluid gushed out from the wound. That presence of such fluid proved that the chambers of his heart had burst. And the seventh item that we know for sure from this passage, Peter and John were intrigued enough by what the, women's, the women reported that they ran to the tomb to investigate it for themselves. Peter and John investigated this tomb for themselves. Luke 24, 12 and John 20, verses 3 to 10. That's what happened on resurrection morning. That's what happened that first Easter Sunday. Everyone was freaking out. Everyone was wondering if it was really true and they were wondering how they could find out if it was true. Now imagine you're staggering around all day, hearing all of this information, maybe even seeing it as some of these folks had, trying to process this information but wait, there's more. Luke also tells us about the afternoon of this resurrection day. He says in Luke 24, starting with verse 13, Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. And then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and they looked discouraged. And verse 18, the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem today who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked them. 
So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then with verse 27, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with one of them, or with them, that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Verse 32, they said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? And that very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven, and those with them gathered together, who said, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. And then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. So that afternoon, Jesus revealed himself to two of the followers, two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke continues with them now back in Jerusalem, and he says in verse 36, as they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst, that's Jesus. And he said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Verse 38, why are you troubled, he asked them. Why do you doubt? Uh, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they still were amazed and in, dis- in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate in their presence. Verse 44, he told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In verse 46, it says, He said to them, This is what is written, The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things, and look, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you're empowered from on high. So on the night of the resurrection, Jesus came to the disciples in the evening, probably in Bethany now, in Luke 24, 36, in John 20, in verse 19. It's, again, it's probably in Bethany because that's where they'd been staying all week long. And in John 20, verse 19, we're told that Jesus walked through the wall to get to them because it, the, the room or the house was closed. And once inside, Jesus showed them his wounds so that they would believe Notice that Jesus' wounds are still with him, even after the death. Jesus' death changed him forever. 
And while he had their full attention, just as we've read through the entire passage that Luke records, he did a Bible study with them. Luke says that he explained the scriptures and the prophets and the Psalms to them from first to last. That's Luke's account of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. Now John, who uh, in his gospel, who wrote his eyewitness account after Luke's gospel had already been published, wanted to add a few more details for us. Again, John was an eyewitness. So he wrote his own account of the Sunday evening meal with Jesus. And he said in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, when it was the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. And having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The two more things that John wanted us to know about the resurrection were that the disciples rejoiced and believed when they saw Jesus. They rejoiced and believed. What they saw, what they heard, what they felt, and what they experienced convinced them that the resurrection really had happened and that Jesus is alive again and in their midst. And the other thing, Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit and authority. Remember that if, we, if you have God's Holy Spirit inside of you, that if you have God's gift of his spirit in you, that's all you'll ever need. Easter Sunday was quite a day, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Resurrection Day, the best day of our lives. Jesus rose from the dead. He met with and he proved himself to no fewer than 16 people, including four women, 10 apostles, Remember, Judas had deserted. He had already hanged himself. And Thomas wasn't there on that first Sunday, plus the two other followers on the road to, to Emmaus. Remember, Jesus walked through a wall. He demonstrated just one of the, the, the new, maybe upgraded features of what our resurrected bodies will be like. And he ate some fish. And doing that demonstrated that he really was still flesh and blood, not a ghost, not an apparition. The resurrection changed everything. The res resurrection means that there really is life after death. And God has made a way for us to get there. It means that we're not evolutionary accidents, but instead we are intentionally created sons and daughters made in God's image with all of God's love and God, all of God's hopes and dreams for us and with us. It means that life has meaning and purpose and something far better to look forward to in our future. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Resurrection Day. Jesus is risen. Indeed. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He's the living Lord of creation. He's the Lamb who was slain for the sin of the world. Your sin and mine. He was crucified, but He returned. He's the resurrected Savior who ascended, but left behind His people to report to us the good news, the gospel. He is the eternal Son of God. Jesus is someone you can trust. My friends, let him have your heart today. Let him have your life today. Let him have your life forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Our song of decision and closing today is just that title, Christ is Risen. The words may not be as familiar to us, but the message is such a powerful message of, of resurrection 
redemption and our future with him. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for Easter and what it really, truly means. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for coming to us and for coming for us, for being with us, for suffering death on the cross. And yet, thank you, Lord, for conquering death for our benefit and for our salvation. Your name is Jesus, and it's in your name we praise you, we thank you, we give ourselves to you. Amen. Come awake, come and rise up from the grave.